Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me in the locker room this evening for the fourth episode in the Conversation with Alan series. I started this series to have open and honest discussion, discussions about the rise of hate, the rise of racism, and the rise of anti-Semitism in the United States with high hopes that it leads to conversations that make us all think about our own place in history and what we can do to change our country. My four guests tonight are here to help celebrate Black History Month, as well as have an open dialogue about the biases, the racial profiling, and the continued systemic racism that is still so prevalent in our country today. The story of Black History Month began in 1915, half a century after the 13th Amendment abolished slavery in the United States. That September, the Harvard-trained historian Carter G. Woodson and Minister Jesse E. Moreland founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, an organization dedicated to researching and promoting achievements by Black Americans and other peoples of African descent. Known today as the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, this group sponsored a National Negro History Week in 1926, choosing the second week of February to coincide with the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. The event inspired schools and communities nationwide to organize local celebrations, establish history clubs, and host performances and lectures. In the many decades since, mayors of cities across the country began issuing yearly proclamations recognizing Negro History Week. By the late 1960s, thanks in part to the civil rights movement and a growing awareness of Black identity, Negro History Week had evolved into Black History Month on many college campuses. President Gerald Ford officially recognized Black History Month in 1976, and then every US president since has officially designated February as Black History Month, calling upon the public to seize the opportunity to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of Black Americans in every endeavor throughout our history. I am joined tonight by Amelia Marshall, who played Jilly Grant on Guiding Light, and villainous Liz Sanborn on Passions. Joining Amelia tonight is her real life son, Marshall Schaefer. Carla Mosley and Lawrence St. Victor played love interests on Guiding Light before they both joined the cast of The Bold and the Beautiful. Today, Lawrence continues to play to Carl Carter Walton on the CBS daytime drama. In addition to their two acting roles, Carla's most important role is raising her two-year-old daughter, Aurora, and Lawrence's most important role is raising his two-year-old son, Christian. It is my pleasure to welcome to the locker room, Amelia Marshall, Marshall Schaefer, Carla Mosley, and Lawrence St. Victor. Hello, hello, and hello. hello. That was a lot of words, but I wanted to start off with, you know, an introduction. So thank well, you guys. all for being here and being open to having this conversation. Well, thank you for having it, man. That's great. Absolutely, and thank you so much for that introduction and for the research and for sharing that. That's so important that we realize why we are here today. Yeah. Co correct. Well, let, let, since it is February and it is Black History Month, what's your earliest memory of your parents or any edu educator teaching you this? Uh, Amelia, you wanna? Teaching Black history per se? Um, well, black, the the cell. I I mean, you're you were in school a little earlier, so when, <laughs> when this became a little earlier than the the other three, a little. But 1976 <laughs> is when President Ford acknowledged it. You know. Correct. So I didn't get that early um, introduction that that that, that you. <laughs> Younger people receive. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of mine was in the moment on an ongoing basis, just in family stories. You know what I mean? Things that 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 were simply passed down or or talked about over the kitchen table. So a lot of, of my black history did not come in a classroom, it did not come from a book, say, but in, in, in real life. Mm -hmm. Lawrence. Um, Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll come back to Marshall since he's the youngest of the the group. So I'll come back. <laughs> but Lawrence. Yeah, it's similar. Like I, I don't like in similar school. We, you. you know, well, in school we would have subjects, and if you know Black History Month, so then we'll just kind of have a a general 
subject, Martin Luther King, but it's very general, very like, we're just gonna cover this for a couple of days and moving on. So in school, I was only aware of like Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks. You know, I didn't, I wasn't aware of the, you know, the, the hundreds of people who are, are the reason why we are here today. But like that came from just conversations with family and stuff. But to be honest, my family were, they were also like off of what they learned in school is what they knew. So a lot of stories didn't get passed around. I didn't really start having a stronger understanding until I became an adult and, or young adult and did my own research and then have my own conversation. But the information just wasn't there for, for my family. And then they didn't necessarily rush out to get it either. So, so yeah, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, <laughs> Malcolm X was a rebel. I remember hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> but then I'll say what, when I yeah. saw my, when I saw X, that mm-hmm. definitely, you know, um, Spike Lee's Malcolm X movie, that definitely started framing my mind around why aren't we learning this stuff? You know, but yeah. Well, that's so interesting because as a Jewish, you know, person, you know, there, Schindler's List really helped me see what my mother had lived through because of the one moment um, in the film that's in red is the little girl. And that was my mother at that age. Mm. So it's, it's so interesting that you, you, you talk. I mean, it is, you know, the cinematic masterpieces can really be enlightening and educational for us at whatever age. Yeah. Because you know, I was probably close to 30 at that time. But Carla, for you? Um, you're somewhat similar. I will say my mom was really involved with school and she uh like create she was on the diversity committee. She might have even created it, you know. <laughs> she's, she's an at, you, at your school. At my school. So she she brought Quants, I remember her like walking up with a Kanara and I'm like, oh God, you know, but I'm like, and um and and you know g- arranging a field trip for us to all go see Alvin Alley and you know things like that that um and then I I had a, a black guidance counselor who was a, a parent of a friend and or a peer um and my mom made sure that she was my guidance counselor and they together really kind of handpicked my teachers in high school um mm. and because of that like I'm you know as I'm hearing this because it was it was like so glossed over uh maybe a poster if that was sort of you know um but but i did have some teachers you know i had one teacher who showed us roots which is kind of dated now but was really uh, you know he showed that every year the whole thing um i had another teacher where we read uh we read baldwin i read the fire next time and i just remember like what is this you know like soaking it up um, I had another teacher who who assigned us their eyes were watching God, Zora Neale Hurston. So um, even though it, you know, they were sort of these moments, they still opened my mind to the possibility of more and the um, just the knowledge that there were these scholars and people discussing the unfortunately the same things that we are discussing today years ago, you know. And Marshall. Um, what Lawrence was saying really kind of struck a chord with me because that was my experience with the education system as well. Um, it was like we got Martin Luther King, uh, Rosa Parks, Malcolm X. Um, it wasn't until probably like 11th grade when I was in a United States like history class that we got deeper into subjects um, where we were talking about Brown versus Board of Education, um, Loving versus Virginia. Um, and we really got to see a little more of the law aspects, but even then, I don't feel like I had really like deep research other than my mom onto the topics of black history. Um, albeit like grew up in LA. So I wasn't, I was in a diverse like community, but never really like had the opportunity to dive deep. I feel like. Mm. So I became a young adult. And, and I know, you know, the country acknowledges it in February, but you live it, you, you know, you all live it every day. But I'm curious, is there something you do or have done or your family taught you to do to celebrate in February? Or, or you have chosen for your own path a way to 
you know, all year or in February? Because, you know, the fact that the country is acknowledging it, do you make it a point? Or, or for Lawrence and, and Carla, will, mm -hmm. you, will you do that for your, you know, young kids who are, you know, coming up in this world? I am, um, my cousin, my mom's cousin and then her daughter, who's my cousin, they, she was really good about uh, being intentional about, you know, they would talk over dinner about different people and, you know, Corey would sort of like have to go research people and then bring them and then they talk about, you know, so I think things like that uh, I would love to do. And I'd say for me, um, I, Martin Luther King's birthday and that day are kind of sacred for me. Like I always try to um, do some research and listening at, on that time. And that was something that we did with the church that I grew up in. They always had a big MLK day thing and we did service. And um, so, yeah, so those are, t those are two things, but certainly I think it is a lived thing. And, and, you know, as we know, um, now more than ever, we, we really do need to be kind of living it in our actions and, and thoughts so that mm -hmm. our kids can ha have it be integrated in a way, like there's a consciousness. So there was a consciousness that I wish that I, that I had, that I'm getting now about blackness and what that means to me and how there were certain um, things that I experienced as a kid that made me feel a little othered, but I didn't realize until now. So, you know, I'm, I'm hoping for that integration. You know, conversations will always educate us, no matter what they are, of whatever subject. But hopefully there'll be a time where we don't have to really sit here to have this in a, in a larger way. Because that's why I feel, you know, uh, you know, I, you know, as a gay and a Jewish man, I'm othered, you know, both things. And I understand that and, you know, uh, want to do that. Lawrence, for you you know, celebrating it or? Yeah, growing up, not too much. It definitely acknowledged it. Um, My dad is from Haiti. He came over here at nine, but his experience as a black man in this country is also very different. It's akin to the African-American experience, but he also comes with a whole nother culture with definitely in my upbringing and my household made it a little different. Um, But for me, what I love about it, and I guess what I pass to my son is, is to keep it going all year round because it's our history and we should be celebrating ourselves and our black and South culture every day. But what this month does, it allows us to have conversations with people who may not listen. You know, it's Black History Month. We're doing this panel. People will watch because this month they're like engineered to like listen. So hopefully down the line, like you said, we can have these conversations and it can be June. We can talk about, exactly, yeah. you know, it doesn't have to be this thing. But for now, this month allows us the platform to speak. And it's like, guys, we have a month. It's a short month. <laughs> <laughs> let, let us have the conversation <laughs> with you. I love that you said that. that you know, but so you're true. right. <laughs> you know? It's like you're being cheated. <laughs> Give us our three days. <laughs> a few days. <laughs> Amelia Marshall. Well, yeah, I very much agree that um, this shouldn't. We shouldn't need a month to talk about Black history. This is something that should just be an ongoing conversation, ongoing education. Just as it's you know, all the other history is unfolded all throughout year in public school education or even private school education. Why do we have to set aside this month to take the deep dive into larger and lesser known um, uh, important people in, within the history of, of African-American history? So um, it's, it, there is an acknowledgement um, for us, for Martin Luther King Day. It actually has, very often coincides with Marshall's birthday, but um, it's the ongoing conversation, I think that's important. It's the mm -hmm. ongoing acknowledgement and talking about what, you know, contributions that, that everyone has made. Yeah, I feel like growing up, black history was an ongoing conversation. Mm -hmm. I mean, during Black History Month, um, at home. Yeah, I was like trying, when you asked that question, I was trying to think about like, did we do anything for Black History Month? But then <laughs> we were always kind of like in that pool of just information. And we were having these conversations of what does it mean to be black now? What does it mean to be 
um, black in the past. I mean, sort of like her growing up before Black History Month was a thing. Absolutely. And me being a child of like the 2000s, that's always going to show like, what does it mean to be black in different ways? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, Good I job, mom. <laughs> Good job, I interviewed Bob, yeah. an author earlier today, uh, a new children's author, black author, and we were talking about this. And I, I, I loved how she described how she talks to. Her. She has a seven-year-old as her youngest, but she basically was saying, which I just thought was fascinating. Just if anything comes up, she just always tries to find something that can relate to their experience in a lesson, like just. You know, let's say you're talking about a president, or you know, uh, you know, may, you know that maybe leads her back to Lincoln and and you know the emancipation or something. It just was a fascinating to always try to educate in you know because it should be an ongoing and not just February. Mm -hmm. And, and so representation we matters, you know. I you know I'll say like my daughter even before she um, was watching TV, she somehow we ended up with these little Doc McStuffins dolls in our house. And you know, it's this cartoon that's not even on anymore, but it's about a little girl who's a doctor to her animals and she's black, she's a doctor. And that was my daughter's first exposure to a doctor. And she's obsessed with doctors now. Like she talks about all this, you know, and it's um, that those, those things that seem little, um, but you know, it's so, so important. We as artists, I feel are really important um, because we do have these platforms because we have the ability to tell our stories more and more. And and it's so interesting that we are in 2021 and we're talking about representation because it 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 matters more today than I think you know ever, which is just sad in a in a way as well. But you know, you know, when we talked about other, you know, being seen as other, can you talk about times that you know? you were treated as other to, you know, so people watching understand some of the, you know, unfortunate um, things that you've been put in, you know, positions by people who aren't just seeing people. <laughs> I, you know, I, I think because I was such a young child at the, the height of, of the movement, and really sort of having relatives confronting the movement in a very, very real way. Um, there were incidents in my childhood that I remember with great clarity. And I'm not sure what I shared with you before, but, um, and I, I'm gonna circle back to this later, but I was um, born in Albany, Georgia in 1958 and I have that flash memory of being downtown with my mom and still seeing the two water fountains. Wow. You know, whites only, colored only. And it's weird because I keep going, did I make that up? And I'm like, no, I didn't make that up. That was there back in the, that those days. And um, it, it, it's those kind of flashes that, um, and have informed me and continue to inform me. It's driving between Albany, Georgia and Columbus, Georgia and knowing that there was a certain town that when you got to that town, everybody sat up straight in the back seat of the car. Nobody said anything, you didn't do anything. You you drove, if it was 35 miles an hour, you drove 35 miles an hour and not 34 or 36 because they were watching to pull you over. And having, having those kinds of memories and then bringing those forward to um, young adulthood and exchanges with, um, you know, my supervisor as I was interning with IBM. And I, you know, to this day, I don't know if it was because I was a woman, because I was black or because I was a woman and who also was black, but it was, you know, coming forward with a piece of technology and idea and basically being told if that were possible don't you think we would we would have done it by now? And we're kind of like you know, slinking out of his office, going, no, but it is possible. You know, I'd done a little you know, schematic of something that I thought needed to be in place. And of course, it came to be many years after that internship. Um, it's those things that you you learn to again 
from you being old, you learn to sort of, <laughs> um, if you can't go through it, you go around or go over it, but you, you are mindful of how you process those exchanges within yourself. You have to be mindful of not feeling in, inferior, to be mindful that 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 other person's problem or that problem within the system, but you have to find your way through that problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, kind of piggybacking on that. I think that in some ways I have certain privilege being in, you know, lighter skin, having um, speaking a certain way, having m more European features in some way, having a certain level of education that have allowed me to escape some of the larger uh, prejudices. But there are microaggressions that I'm now unpacking that I am finding are, you know, kind of similar to what Amelia is talking about that we just, it's like, oh, right. Yeah, there aren't as many in, in our industry, there aren't, yeah, there just aren't as many roles. Okay, cool. So we're just gonna have to create our own thing. It's just like things that you just sort of accept. And then one day wake up and go like, wait a sec, that's, that's weird. Or even, you know, the other day, I was at the playground with my daughter and she was having a tantrum because she's two. And I, was, <laughs> and I was like picking her up when we were leaving. Um, and I had this moment of, you know, watching a, um, an older white man watch us and maybe he was just watching us because she's you know making a fuss but i had this moment of like does he think i'm gonna hit her you know what does he think about my daughter my daughter's the only black girl on the playground is she you know do they think she has behavioral issues things like that and i was so surprised and it took me you know a good 24 hours and talking to some other mm -hmm. <laughs> black moms to, mm -hmm. to just go why is this why can't i let this go you know um and and realizing that those are the things that are internalized that you know other parents don't have to deal with. Mm. Yeah, um, for me, just slowly becoming aware as I got older. Um, and I've been trying to unpack this, and I don't even know if this is how it broke down in my family, but I feel like around a certain time, 60s earlier, earlier, like you had two groups of Black people, right? The movement, education, fight, push it forward at all costs. And the other group that's like, I just want my children to come home. Mm -hmm. Say yes, mm -hmm. sir, nod, and just come home. And I feel like as time went on, that turned to just get a get your degree in high school. Just get a degree in high school, get a degree in college, just get a job. Don't put yourself in a position to not be accepted. And I feel like that's what my lineage came from to a degree. It wasn't the rattle the cage. It was the, no, just be smart, show up on time, do what you got to do. And that's kind of how I grew up. So I would notice and become aware of certain things that felt weird, but didn't really have anyone. I'm sure I could have spoke to my parents about it, but I, it just didn't dawn on me to speak to them about it. I was just like, oh, that's interesting. You know, um, in school, a well, teacher called- When you're young, you don't- processing things like that and yeah you know, and, and, and if you're in a black community it's like you don't we're all kind of treated this way or you don't think that you're different and when i um ran track in high school and we got to go to the different schools and i'm like they got money <laughs> we would walk through their hallways like what is this it looks like and it's like 15 minutes from my school and it's just like oh this looks different and then, you know, when I decided to become an actor and like Carla said, the roles that are available, you just kind of accept it. And then, you know, driving in, pulled over by cops for what? Who knows? <laughs> uh, my boy's handcuffed. I'm sat on the curb and I asked to see his badge number. And he's like, oh, you want to go down that road? And I'm like, what road? Like, I should know your badge number. So over time, just, just becoming super aware of just the overt and systemic racism, um, which it's very infuriating because then you start looking back at your life and your childhood and your schooling and like it was in your face the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of been my experience with it. Not, not one particular, I mean, there have been particular things that have happened, of course, but it's more or less just this, this like taking this matrix pill and it's like, yo, I've been plugged in this whole time and didn't even know. Wow. <laughs> <You> wow. know? <laughs> 
It does. It takes time to fully grasp a lot of things that you've experienced or or that you even learn from your parents or or that your parents taught you. But it just, you know, at certain times in your life, it'll be like, oh, that's what they were trying to, you know, get across. Marshall, for you, I know, you know, if you, if you want to talk about the moment with the computer. Computer. Laptop? A laptop. Hamilton? Hamilton. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, not Hamilton the musical. No, I'm all Hamilton the musical. computer. Was there? A... <laughs> I I feel I feel like there's like as growing up in LA. Um, I mean, my mom was acting for the first part of like the majority of like my early years. I mean, yeah, up yeah. until I was like nine, ten. Um, so I just kind of remember. Um, be like I I what I'm trying to lead to right now is like I was not really aware of what it meant to be black until I became a young adult. Um where I was a fun like a funny story is that um the first time I ever auditioned for Hairspray the musical, <laughs> um I ended up being the only black person in the cast and they cast me as Corny Collins and rewrote the entire story. Which kind of was like very much, it was like, hold up, there is a black character, a black person here. I'm not you see me. That makes no sense. Yeah. So at first, I was kind of like confused. I was like, interesting. Hmm. Um, middle school came around where because I was so devoted in the theater, and what Carla was saying, I what didn't necessarily speak how people thought black people spoke, I was constantly told I was just a white person in a black person's body. Um, yeah, identity issues at 12 years old, you know when kids are most vulnerable <laughs> going through puberty, oh, I don't need to have any racial confusion as well. <laughs> right. And high school <laughs> by, went by without any major issues, but then I was sort of introduced to diversity of Black people, um, which opened up my world. But at the same time, I was still in the theater. And in theater, you kept your, you did your own thing. It's like we were committed to like lunchtime rehearsals, after school rehearsals. So I never really had the opportunity to like talk to other people mm -hmm. um, other than who was in my circle. Like, it was so like, of course we had black people in the musical, even when we did The Wiz, but I did not understand the microaggressions going on at that time. I was more of, and I'm willing to, willing to say it, I was more of a don't rub anybody the wrong way, get a, try to get ahead, try to get far. Um, and then undergrad came about and then I was really introduced to like, diversity um, and the man, what this leads up to sort of like um, whatever what Alan and mom were talking about with when I went to go back to visit um, it was me and my best friend biracial woman uh, we were visiting um, our my high school I went a little later because I took the train she went to go pick up her little brother and as I'm walking right in front of the school I get stopped by police and I'm dressed in like uh, like black shorts. Um, I have like a little backpack on. I even though I had like facial hair, I definitely looked like a young like a student, maybe even like a high school senior at the time because I was only 20 years old. I still remember clearly like what high school was like and yet um, here I am, a six foot tall black man, and apparently there is a report of a tall black man with headphones on in all black who was harassing a student at the school. That's all they told me. Um, the police officers were Mexican and one was black, but still I felt in terror for my life because they just said, you fit, you fit the description, we're just gonna hold you until we can clear you. Um, but hold you meant what? Like put me in the back of the police mm. press on. Um, and I just remember there was this 
black mother in the parking lot of my high school, just keeping her eyes on the situation. And I was like, I did not know whether or not to be embarrassed or just be like thankful that there was someone watching to make sure that nothing went wrong. Mm -hmm. And it sort of led up until they were asking me questions about why I was there. I was like, you know, I'm here with my best friend. Um, we're going to pick up her little brother. Um, and they're like, oh, are you an alumni? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, okay, where do you go to school now? I'm like, Princeton University. And they were like, oh. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we definitely have the wrong guy then. And I'm like. Well, it was when they pulled out your laptop out of your backpack, right? And they saw the Princeton sticker. It was my like, wallet. Oh, your wallet. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it was my wallet. They pulled out my ID and they were like, oh, so we'll just let you go because that definitely isn't you. No, you go Princeton. No way you could be the guy we're looking for. And I'm like, <laughs> it's just like so problematic. I mean, all of right. it. <laughs> That's <laughs> problematic. What if you didn't go to Princeton? What if you decided to cut hair after high school? You're a barber and you just visiting your friends. You didn't go to Princeton. You didn't have all these things that would make them go, oh, you're different than the rest of them. Yeah. You know, that, that type of exception thing that we kind of fight or fall into. It's, it's so crazy. And here's the most confusing part. Like, as soon as, like, they let me go, I'm obviously shaken, like, shaken up. And the black police officer, the black police officer was talking to me the entire time, being like, hey, I know how it looks. Just breathe. We're just going, we're just making sure that you're not the guy we're looking for. And I'm like, thanks, you still have me here, but thanks like, for the words. And then as soon as we get her little brother um, and we're leaving, they stop me and they say, hey, by the way, we found the guy, sorry about that. And I'm like, thanks, I'm out. It's, wow. it's, it's, it's interesting when you talked about the black police officer, because I think what like we don't understand collectively as a country is that as much as you're taught through media to hate black people, be scared of black men, degrade black women. Black people are also taught to do that to each other as well. Like we're eating off the same plate. Mm -hmm. So when I went to, you know, me and my friends going to a corner store and a woman looks at the clerk and says, don't worry, I watch them. That was a black woman. Mm -hmm. You know, she's already taught that we're criminals. You know, that cop is like, it's a 50-50 chance you can be the guy. We had to shoot our shot. <laughs> we had to take a chance, right? You get it. Like, we, we, we know how we do. And it's that thing of where we're, where the trauma is so rooted in our in, in our history that until we become aware and learn it, it's like we're, we're part of the machine. Mm -hmm. And then when I heard when you talk about how that cop was trying to say, it's going to be okay. It's like, dude, but you know my rights, though. Right. Like, you know my rights. Why, why are you going to my wallet? Why, why are you frisking me without like just cause? Like, mm -hmm. you know my rights. Yeah. So I'm sorry, that just got me going. No, that <laughs> is true. a very, very it's... important point. And it's important to make that point so that we're not categorizing and grouping everybody, you know, all police officers, all white police officers, right. all, you know, those things need to be ex explored and exploded almost. I'm, we have to talk mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. Like, even, and this is a conversation I constantly have to have with my father, white Jewish man, um, whenever, especially when I visit him in Texas. Uh, and I've become hyper aware of any police officer now, whether I'm on the subway, whether I go to a CVS, whether I'm taking a bike ride back in Houston, I'm hyper aware and I feel every eye on me. Um, I mean, during the, middle, the beginning, like to talk about otherness, um, when the pandemic started, I decided to live with my dad in Houston for a couple of months because I was like, it's safer in Texas. Well, it was at the time. <laughs> <laughs> he lives in River Oaks, which was just kind of like a very white area. And every time I went out for a bike ride, I felt many eyes on me. Mm -hmm. Um and it's something that I constantly brought to my dad. And he'll only just brush it off and say, we have black people in the neighborhood. Why are you so like nervous? And I'm like. They're probably feeling it too, dad. <laughs> you <have that. laughs> but I love Lawrence that you pointed out that the woman in like the bodega or whatever was black because 
you know, that's not something I would think that, that, you know, sort of say it out loud, I think is important. So people understand that it's, it's, you know, it's coming from everybody. Yeah. I mean, you know, growing up, we were taught like, it's either you are educated or you're going to look like a thug. So choose. And that was, you know, that's from each other because we know we're super aware of how we come off and, and, and we, we were, we're, we're brainwashed to look at each other that way. Um, yeah. And it, it's very trauma. Like the trauma runs deep. Like you can't have this much oppression without some serious trauma. And, and until you become aware of it, you're, you're walking around hurt and you don't know why. Um, yeah. and, and to circle back to history and why this month came about, why people felt it was so important is, you know, yeah, if we think back to slavery and the way that black folks were pitted against each other then, you know, when people talk about it being systemic, that's what it is. We're all a part of it. It's a system that has raised us to believe certain things that we don't even know. And we can't change things that we don't know. So that's why mm -hmm. education is so important. Mm -hmm. so true. When I was at um, Purchase, when I studied at the conservatory, uh, we had our class, it was our first day like orientation and we were all sitting in a circle and I was the only black guy there. Um, there was one other black guy, but he was much older. Um, and this black dude comes in my age and it was weird. It wasn't an articulated thought. It was the feeling of, oh, it's probably gonna be me or him. Cause in the school had cuts and it was like, uh, it's one of us is probably not gonna make it. It's like, he's the one, it's gonna be me or him. And it's like, where'd that thought even come from? Oh, wow. And he's like my best friend now. And we had, we had no problem in school, but the thought of it's one or the other, like. And you're like 20 and things. you're like 20 years old. You yeah. Know, so the and thought... To be honest, oh. both of us didn't stay, you know, they, they found a way to get him out because he didn't comply. You know, he didn't mm. shuck and jive where me, I was like, I know how to code switch. So I'm gonna talk a certain way. <laughs> around the teacher, which is awful but that's the truth i'm like i know how to, i'm gonna talk a certain way around the teachers i'm gonna sound smart around them i'm gonna be likable and unthreatening and and that's subconscious that's not even like me saying i gotta do this it's a subconscious survival mechanism that kicks in well um, i think that's you know being gay around straight people that trying to act butcher you know because we're in high school I'm sure I didn't want people to think I was the gay kid, you know, it's, and, and you, it becomes a natural, you know, a natural, you know, thing that you do to act, <laughs> you know, a different way. Um, Marshall, you know, the um, thing that happened to you outside your high school and, and for Lawrence and Carla as well, and uh, Amelia, because you grew up at a different time, I'm curious about your parents. Um, but I mentioned this, on, on one of the shows about the uh, Twitch, who is the dancer on Ellen, when the George Floyd thing happened, he talked about lessons his mother had taught him. And one of the ones, which I thought was just a fascinating one, because I had not heard it, was to never walk out of a department store without the receipt for what you've purchased in your front pocket. Mm -hmm. um, and he talked about being, you know, chucked against a wall by a security guard in the mall because he liked to walk out of the stores with his you know, sweatshirt on, you know, which we all did. I loved, you know, you go buy a hoodie or a pair of sneakers, you love to put, put them on and walk out. And that's, mm -hmm. I couldn't even imagine that's, you know, somebody would come up to me thinking I would have, you know, I would have stole that. And, um, you know, I'm just curious, Marshall, you know, being approached by the cops, was there something, you know, did mom teach you, you know, play, you know, play it cool or, um, Do you recall those types of things that you had to have those conversations? Just, you know, yes, sir, no, sir. Mm -hmm. And keep it to that. Stay respectful. Um, it's, it's funny that you bring up code switching. Um, yeah. Definitely that is something that I've also used, like weaponized for a survival skill. Um, I mean, because automatically, I usually feel like whenever I'm in that kind of situation where I'm being approached by authority, I will code switch into something more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't even know how to describe it, but just kind of like, well, 
you know, it's it's almost like, you know, Lawrence, you were saying, you know, suddenly you have to like not be as tall as you are. Hard. Not, oh, be, yeah. not be imposing. So your body posture changes. So the you voice can, goes a little higher. <laughs> yes. All of those things. All of those things. And, yeah. And yeah, we, you know, we, we laughingly, but seriously talk, say it's the, the talk. No, the yes sir, no sir. The talk. Stay respectful to the police officer so you survive, you know. I mean, yeah, that's always going to have to be a conversation. And um, Alan, when you were speaking about, I was never taught like that specifically of having the receipt in the front pocket. Now I'm gonna do it, but my... <laughs> 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 but my whatever, whenever I walk into any kind of store, I'm always hyper aware. That. I'm like, if I'm wearing a backpack, can't touch the backpack. If I do touch the backpack, do it in front of an employee. Um, never reach for your jacket. Never reach for the pockets unless you're paying for something. Um, and that's just something that I had to like start doing on my own because I was like, okay, don't want to give them an excuse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think for me, it was um, definitely the nice, you know, the like this, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and it's so funny because my mom, you know, um, she's just, well, anyway, she's older. So I, won't, I won't out her. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but when, I'll say when she turned 60, which was some years ago now. Um, <laughs> She, she just suddenly like grew in her own ownership and, you know, something switched for her and she started saying, just speaking up more and saying, you know, finding her voice and um, kind of encouraging that in me in a way that I, I wish she had taught me earlier, but, you know, saying things like, you know, Carla, not everyone has to like you. And I'm like, since when? But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I realized that those are little things that, it just was, you know, it was like, this is how you get by is just by being super, super likable, super easygoing, doing, you know, bending over backwards, always the one to give, always the one to, you know. Um, and I will say that being, again, being a mother, uh, it's something, you know, I, I want to protect my daughter, but I also have this, this niceness thing ingrained in me. And there are certain times where it's challenging for me to speak up. And, you know, she's forcing me, as kids do, out of my comfort zone to begin to, to do that and, and stand up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, they didn't, I, I didn't get a lesson. I think I was just naturally afraid of the police just enough to just naturally be polite. Um, but one thing that, that, that was very impactful for me was um, when I got pulled over by the police, me and my friend, in Manhattan, got pulled over after a red light. I'm like, we, we didn't speed, we're in Manhattan. <laughs> we didn't run the light, why are they pulling us over? Two black guys in an Acura. They, they cuffed my friend because he's been beaten up by the police before and he knows his rights. So he's letting them know like, I know my rights, what you can and can't do. And me, I'm just being, you know, hey, whatever you guys want, I sit on the curb and all that stuff. You wanna search my car, search my car, I don't got nothing. I was on guiding light during that time. I was on a billboard on like 50, you know, 57th, <laughs> 57th Street. Street. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm wearing nice clothes. I'm clean cut. And that taught me like, it doesn't matter. And I appreciate the, 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 the mother that taught, you know, her son, like have the receipt. It don't matter. You can be in a, in an Armani suit. You can have all the receipts in your pocket. If that cop, it, it's it's so rooted in, in, in really evil, it doesn't matter. I think sometimes our media creates these images of the kinds of people that get attacked by police, the kinds of people that would fit the description. It doesn't matter. Like you can, you can literally look like Theo Huxtable and you can still be pinned down on the ground, mm -hmm. you know? So that's what woke me up was like, man, I can't outsmart this. I can't outlikable this. I can't code switch my way through this. This is in my face. And the best thing I can do is just educate myself and be aware. And that was my friend did. He was like, what we're going to do, you get the light, you got, you got the license plate. I said, I got half of it. He's like, bet, I got the other half. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's teamwork. 
teamwork because they want to give us a badge number. So it's like we file complaints because what you do, if you file enough complaints that shows up on their record, if it shows up on their record, it affects their ability to get promotions and it affects their money. And at that point, like that's the way you can fight. That's the way you can do things. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, um, Victoria Platt is another actress who was on Guiding Light. And I interviewed her and her husband. They met on Guiding Light and they're raising a six-year-old daughter. And she was telling me a story that in LA, they noticed somebody being pulled over. Uh, Victoria was with her daughter. She might've been, I, I don't want to say she was this age. It was probably like four, two years ago or something like that. But Victoria sort of pulled over to you know, make sure the cops were treating this person correctly. But the daughter knew, like she just, she's like, are we looking out for the, you know, to make sure the cop doesn't do something and, mm -hmm. you know, just, you know, powerful and, and horrible that it has to happen. But I'm glad she does. You know, it is, it, it taught me like to pay attention to who's being pulled over because, mm -hmm. you know, you, by watching, we might be able to, you know, help somebody. I will say, know. I was so heartened. I was driving in West Hollywood, must have been a couple months ago, and there was a man who, I don't know if it was drugs or, you know, mental illness, or both, you know, kind of in the road off to the side. And there was um, a, a white man who was standing and like kind of keeping watch. And, you know, I don't know if cops were coming or what, but it was just really... You know, it's like, okay, these conversations that we're having, all of the marching that we're doing is 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 penetrating, yeah. you know, it, and that feels good. Mm -hmm. And Amelia, for, for you, was there, um, I mean, you were a young guy when the, when the civil rights bill was passed. Did your parents teach you? You know, did you have some lessons like this? Do you recall those lessons? I... <laughs> I, 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 you know, yes, in a way. And I'm going to go back to what Carla was saying about education. Because I wanted to, tonight, because we talk about people who are inspirational. We talk about John Lewis's and Stacey Abrams. Mm -hmm. We talk about these people. But, but very much to what your question is, um, the lessons that, you know, I learned as a child during that period were from the everyday people. And I want to talk very briefly about my mother, Catherine White Marshall, and my aunt, Annette Jones White, because they did a couple really remarkable things. Um, my mom um, went to Payne College, which is an H HBCU. Um, she graduated, I think, around... Um, 55. <laughs> 55 with an undergrad. She was salutarian. Um, wow. She wanted to pursue her master's. So she applied to the um, University of Georgia. And everybody knows about George Wallace, University of Georgia. It's 1956. They didn't want to say no, but they said no. But the alternative they gave her was we will pay for any school that will accept you. So my mom, being kind of smart, said, I'll apply to Columbia. Mm -hmm. yeah, she accepted, they paid for her transportation, room and board, tuition for her to get her master's degree. So <laughs> earlier I was saying, okay, somebody won't let you through that door, find a way around, find a way over. I was like, dang, mom, really? <laughs> Albany, Georgia on a train to go, but that's, that was, and I still think about that. I think about how young she was and, and, and just how challenging it all must have been. Complete change in social community and everything. And um, I'm, I'm really, that story inspires me, but my aunt Annette also inspires me. Again, Albany, Georgia, got her um, registered vote in high school very much aware, very much a campus leader. She elected to go to Albany State College, it was then. She was, again, born leader, um, ended up being elected Miss Albany State. So it's 1961, 
1962, the Albany movement is happening. Martin Luther King is coming to town. Protests are going on. She gets called into the administrator's office and said, we need you to stand down. We need you to stop participating, stop rallying these kids to go on these marches or else you have to relinquish your crown and the scholarship that goes with it. My Aunt Annette does the exact <laughs> opposite. She pushes her way to the front <laughs> S line, make sure she's one of the people that got arrested for protesting. She spent a little time in jail because that's what they did. <laughs> so yeah. she, she returns to the university to try to make up the work that she missed while she was in jail. She was called into the administrator's office and expelled. So she lost scholarship money. She lost the crown. Now she's out of, of Albany State College. She's like, okay, fine. I'll go to Spelman. She went to Spelman. Uh, Ended up getting um, her degree there, getting a little bit of scholarship money. Ended up getting a master's from, I think, Virginia State University. So pushing through, pushing through. Fast forward. Let me wait. Hold, let me pause there and say <laughs> what she said at the time was, it is my job as Miss Albany State to lead the people, to mm -hmm. lead Peers, oh, wow. to represent and show what we should be doing. So I'm sorry, I have to do this, you know. So fast forward 2010, they call her and 39 other people, some well-known names back to Albany State to give them honorary degrees. And they actually recrowned her Miss uh, Albany State uh, with a tiara and all. <laughs> so yeah, growing up with those stories, Growing up seeing that, you know, my relatives were like, okay, you're not gonna stop me. I'm gonna do what I think is right. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna grab what I can. Mm -hmm. And so I unfortunately, or fortunately, everybody knows I'm very outspoken. I swear I get it from my relatives. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanna encourage you, Carla, yeah, speak up, be nice. <laughs> speak up and your children will make you do it. That's literally how you got through like, High, like Everywhere. at high school, yeah. <laughs> I heard all the stories all the time. That's so great, and it, and yeah. they, you know, I'm like, write those. The producer in me always write like those movies. movies. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I really I keep saying that. I keep saying the pandemic. I've got so many stories from that period. I need to write it. <laughs> Oh. Yeah. Well, that's why I know Carla. You love to sing. I was, you know, saying that Marshall's going to NYU from, you know, writing lyrics. You, you two need to get together. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> but I'm um, just singing so much out in LA. Yes, please. <laughs> I bet you do. So let, you know, we have to talk about you know Trayvon Martin, Rayshard Brooks, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. Just a small number. Can you talk about when that happens? how it hits you and and if there are some from your childhood that had an impact on you for whatever reason, I mean, death is a reason enough, but I just mean if there's a, a story that had an impact on, on your life and who you are today. Um, well, uh, yesterday was the year anniversary. <laughs> it's been a year since Ahmaud Arbery was killed. And I, you know, in sort of prepping for this, I thought, okay, well, let me just sort of dip into what's going on. And I, you know, pulled up, you know, it's like pick any podcast. I'm, I'm listening to so many political podcasts, and uh, and they were talking about these three boys who were just killed in Fort Wayne, Texas, really brutally. Um, mm -hmm. And I just thought, <laughs> it's, it's just, it's always there. Like, I don't need to. You know, I, if I feel like, oh gosh, I'm out of it. I haven't really been watching the news. You just scratch the surface. It's right there. And um, mm -hmm. it's kind of what we, we've been talking about that, you know, we just, we keep going, we keep pushing, we keep, cause that's what, the, I mean, the beauty, when we talk about celebration, the beauty of what our people have done and have taught us to do is to keep going, to be fierce, you know, to keep, mm -hmm. but just scratch the surface. And, you know, it's, um, oh, yeah. it's all there. Well, that's, you know, I'll just, sorry, quickly, you know, January 6th for me. I mean, the fact that it's 75 years after World War II and I, you know, I think, thank God my parents are dead because if, 
my parents were alive to see somebody wear a t-shirt that said 6 million were not enough in 2020, mm. you know, <laughs> you know, it's just, what, where are we, you know, we're going back instead of forward. And we really need, that's why I, you know, I'm so thankful you're doing this because we do have, you know, people listening, you know, if we change one person, it's been worth this conversation to me. Dude, I got so angry when George Floyd was murdered, not just at the travesty of his death, but it was like Black Lives Matter, people are marching and we still had to justify our existence. We still had to fight all lives matter and blue lives matter. And it's like, what more do you need for you to accept us as human beings like in the moment where we are being broken and you catching it on camera i still have to say hey we're human like why am i fighting you right now like why is this a thing black lives matter it should be all black lives matter why is that the conversation right now oh he was high he's like and if he was Oh, he was a criminal. He had a he he beat one of his, his his baby mamas. So then you you lean on his neck and you suffocate him. It was it infuriated me how much how many conversations I had to have just to justify why it's not okay to murder somebody on the sidewalk. And then the conversations where you know not 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 directly friends, but just online and, and with some people, it's like it's not my. I love the conversation, but it is so not black people's job to educate you on your own history. It is not. Stop. And then, then, then the, 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 the terms and words, we're allies. How are you an ally? This is your mess. Like literally, it's not, no, this is American history. It's America's problem. So it, it got me so infuriated because it's like, I'm watching, the machine that in a year or two years from now make it so nothing happens at work. The silly, the arguments that don't, don't make sense. Uh, you're my ally. Okay. What if you're about to lose your job walking with me? Oh yeah, you know, oh, cause you're an ally. It's not your problem, it's my problem. So yeah, I, it just got me so angry just to watch how just to, you know, and you know, the, the, the social media is very different now. So we, we're, we're getting such an influx of information and different personalities. And for some reason, if, if you know, and then it gets political and then it just gets ugly. And it's like, a man died. How is that not the point? So yeah, that, that got me, that got me going. <laughs> Amelia and Mark, yeah. I, every, every death, especially when they are my age, really hits. But to sort of like name one that really hit me, Elijah McClain. And I, I'm an I'm I'm artist. I'm a very nerdy, socially awkward person. And that hit the hardest when you're someone like me. And I mean, it's like, you know, being a, you have a lot of these people who are like really cried out for a lot because he wasn't ours. But it's like, no one, every, what Lawrence said, no one should be killed by the police and all these racist people because of who we are. And, but mm -hmm. seeing another artist, seeing someone who is who has that passion hit so hard because it reminded me of how I felt when I was in the back of that police car that they don't see me as queer, biracial, like artist. They don't see me as like the playwright. They don't see me as the complete video game nerd. They don't see me <laughs> for all the things that my friends appreciate me. They don't see me as a passionate person. They see me as someone who could potentially be a danger. And, you know, it's always going to be hard to talk about these things. And one thing that 
Lawrence really got me thinking about is that it's like it, it's not just like these allies. We love them, we appreciate them, but at any point, if they are challenged, like and they might lose it all, it's like how many of them will remain? God. <laughs> I mean, y'all remember that Kendall Jenner Pepsi commercial? That was that was just playing in my head of her thinking that she could solve everything by giving a can. Oh Pepsi. yeah, oh such a such a mess. And these are conversations I have to have with the white side. These are conversations I have to have with my significant other. These are conversations I have to have with the non-black people in my program because it's always gonna be complex. Um, and not, we can't simplify, generalize anything that we're going through because how are we supposed to really burn down everything into like an elevator pitch? Oh, let me pitch you <laughs> about my life. Yeah. I I, well said, Marshall. Well mm -hmm. said. Mm -hmm. I um, God, it, it does, Lawrence. Feel like the burden of education is on us. It really does, and I'm sorry to say that. Um, and I think in recent days, what I'm concerned about is, you know, we had all that talk about defund the police without really understanding what we meant by defund the police. But the police are not qualified to do the kinds of interventions that they are being called upon to do. So, right. recently, you know, with the with the nine year old getting pepper sprayed because she yeah. and, and, and we've got people and more and more people who are who are having mental illness and who have issues. And the police are being called in and their gut reaction is to be violent against these people. And that's not. It, it, it just feels like on a daily basis, you know, they released the video of the homeless um, black man in, in, somewhere in California. And you hear the officer saying, hey, should we should we stop him from jaywalking? Should we go over there? And, you know, he was going to jaywalk. He's a homeless man. He was leaving a shelter. But he happened to be African-American. And they probably wouldn't have intervened if he wasn't African-American, but the man ended up being killed because he was jaywalking, because he had a mental illness. He could not process what was going on. He just felt accosted or, or just, you know, not able to within that moment go, yes, sir, no, sir, I'll step back on the sidewalk. It's, I, I, if I were, I were a campaign at this point, it would be get the police off of those phone calls. Mm -hmm. Those need to go to qualified people because what's happening right now when people are, are emotionally charged and I kind of left the house in Manhattan the other day and I heard three arguments within probably two hours and I'm thinking everybody is so vulnerable right now, mm -hmm. so fragile that the least little friction turns into a quick fire thing and I, it makes you not want to pick up the phone and call the police. It's like, okay. Which let them slug it out, you know. Mm. And I, I think that's the thing that's hurting me more. I, I mean, I think that I mean you've seen me at my lowest when it comes to my mental health, and you've seen how I shut down. Mm -hmm. And thank the Lord that I was not in a comfortable position because, I mean, yeah, mental illness something that I'm big advocate for, and I'm like. <laughs> If, if I was a politician, I would say, like, make, like, put more money into mental health services. Yeah. Get everybody in this country a therapist. Because everyone, Correct. Yeah. Everyone could, everyone, and today more so than ever before, because of just even what you just said, Amelia, walking down the street, people are tense for some reasons, you know, a pandemic can do that to, you know, you know, at home and teaching your kids. So 100% Marshall. Mental health needs to be addressed in this in country. In qualified people. Correct. To like, there was a study that was done where you had a, a group of white teachers, wonderful teachers, lovely teachers, and they all separately were asked to watch a group of kids, white kids or black kids. Those teachers were told, 
I, this I is an old you. study, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I yeah. Think so. It's a very old study. Yeah, this is fantastic. I had never heard it. We're told someone stole something here. Someone's a troublemaker. Find the one. And all the teachers separately chose the black kid. At the end of the study, they said none of the kids stole anything. They're just playing. Yeah. And the teachers were horrified because, you know, they're, they're not, they're, they're wonderful, loving teachers. They would never think that they have a racist bone in their body. But put in a position, they chose the black kids. And that was like, the kids are like five. So oh. At five years old, a black yeah. child loses his innocence. So when you have police on the street using excessive force in your mind, you're thinking that this human and, and that product of slavery, they're superhuman. They can take the lashings. They can take the beatings. They can work in the field for 15, 16 hours. They can do it because that's the way they're made. They're like, they're like animals. They're like bears. So now when you have a black man or a black woman with a mental health issue, you're going for your gun. You're going for excessive force because you're looking at this person like they're 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 this like a wolf. Mm -hmm. And 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 that 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 stems from just our education, what's passed down. That's part of the culture in this country, unfortunately. And at least mental mental health professionals have educated themselves enough out of that <laughs> to deal with people individually. Mm -hmm. But I think you're absolutely right. We're calling the wrong people to handle. And because the job of the police is to de-escalate situations. Yeah. You're not supposed to escalate them. Right. You, do, you know, everyone's supposed to go home or go to jail <laughs> safely. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, I completely agree. We were having the wrong people doing a bad job. <laughs> Marshall, sorry, I interrupted you if you wanted to continue on that. I mean, uh, you know, it's uh, Lawrence brought up a very good point, especially when it comes to like educators. Um, it's one of those mom hates it, but I'm very active on the internet. I see a lot of things, but it's one one post. Hey, hey, hey! <laughs> one post I've seen was just asking a simple question: At what age did you have your first black male educator? Hmm. Wow! I didn't have one until my junior year of college, <laughs> and I had two that year, one in dance, one in anthropology. Um, I had black women teachers, but I didn't have one until college. Uh, that was a man. Yeah, it's so interesting. Um, I am thinking too, and I I don't think I had any black women. Oh, I guess a, a chorus teacher in high school. But the first black male teacher I had was um, either freshman or sophomore year social studies. And he empowered me so much to speak my mind, to speak about politics, to debate. And then when I got into NYU, I was like, I really wanted to go. And I was just very concerned about money and how I, you know, because I ended up, you know, putting myself through school. And I was thinking, well, should I go to this other place? And I really didn't want to go there. And he was like, you'll find a way. You'll, and I mean, he his voice really made me feel like I would, and I did, mm -hmm. um, but that's, you know, I, I never thought about the fact that he really was one of the few male, the only male black educator, I think, that I'd had in before, through high school, and um, and then, and then we said it early in the, we said it early in the show, though, and it goes to what Marshall just said, but representation matters. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> yep. Having somebody who has lived that experience educating you and educating your you know and not your... just for us for everybody you know i yeah. really, i remember that too my mom really advocating when she was doing this whole diversity thing you know and, and she actually like had some busing going on between our districts and stuff at the time but she you know she said it's not just for for the black and brown kids it's for everyone because having different kinds of people in a classroom enriches everyone we all have these you know alan like you have your conversations that you had with your family we all have these different stories that we mm -hmm. bring and being in conversation and in the same rooms with different kinds of people is the best way to learn about each other and our, our mutual histories and I think a lot of people, you know, you know, like my parents are Holocaust survivors, so they 
they definitely talked about it, but you know, they, you know, they didn't as well because it's a very painful thing, but you know, well, we only yeah. learn through these stories and other people's shared experiences. I mean, it, it's, you know, the whole political thing was so out of whack this year. And, and, you know, I, I don't, I won't, you know, I know, I think how we all feel, but, you know, for me, the last form, the former president was very much like, you know, Hitler and yeah. leading us down a horrible path that was very similar to what, you know, my parents lived through. And it, and it was hard for me to see people, you know, Marshall, I spend time online too, you know, reading and, and sometimes commenting and trying to, you know, argue a point, but, you know, I, I keep sharing, you know, what, you know, the family that saved my mother, uh, the mother and father risked 11 lives to save two people they didn't know. And I just keep saying that because, you know, with what we are all experiencing or what we were prior to election day, you know, I just needed to keep shouting. You know, I didn't speak up a lot as a, you know, young kid and my parents aren't here, you know, to, to use their voice, which I don't know that they would anyway, but, you know, we have to, you have to, you know, we all have to, because, you know, there's so much misinformation and the, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't even fully understand what the former president was trying to do with the black history and trying to get it taken out of school or whatever that was, but horrible. That you know, that's we need to educate. Education is the key to re for all of us. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Um. When the other thing that I was going to say when you were talking about things that were passed down, uh, or things that lessons that were taught is family family business. You know, my mom would talk about that a lot, yeah. like family business. Mm -hmm. And um, and there were things that it was just like you don't talk about that. And mm -hmm. I think that that's starting to shift, you know, I mean, it will always be there. It's part of families and <laughs> family dynamic, but the, the cultural, mm -hmm. the, the way that that's been passed down culturally as, you know, in the black community and in many marginalized community about ways that we, we can't share our full selves. We can't be our full selves because that will somehow um, keep us out, keep us on the outside. Um, and that's that, so it's exciting to, to start to push back. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it, it's really true. How do you, you know, let we should talk about it. How, you know, and I, I know it's getting late, so I won't keep you too much longer. But how do you feel about today's black leaders? Are there any that particularly speak to you? Uh, I I am so in love with Stacey Abrams. I I, I you know, <laughs> I I I don't know. I listen to her speak, and I cry. She has the patience, the intelligence, the depth, the poise, the, the, the pros that make me wanna say, you are my next president. I can't wait to vote for her. I, um, I, she's an amazing woman. And I think about she talk, the fact that she took a personal loss and won. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, I mean, you, I mean that, I don't think yep. we've, I don't think we've seen that in man, woman, child, black, white, green, purple of somebody taking a loss like that and turning it into like oh. one of the hugest wins. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. She's, she's, yeah. I'm, I need to go stand in line somewhere so I <laughs> shake her hand. <laughs> here, here. Yeah. She's unbelievable. Um, and I think I, you know, as I, I'm learning, I'm interested in learning more about history and I'm, I'm curious about and listening to a lot of the artists, you know, um, like Amanda Gorman, who we all saw, or many of us, you know, just so, so fresh and, and they're- Talk and, about words. Yeah, uh, you know, the Marshalls, but you know, <laughs> I, I really do think that there's, there, that young people um, have a voice and a sense of self because of what's happening now, because of what we're, you know, the with the work that everyone's doing that I admire and that I'm learning from. You know, the kids from Overland Park in Florida, really, you know, what they did after that tragedy to me, 
the articulation oh, yeah. of these eight, these eighteen year olds. I was really so inspired and was really rooting for them to you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, for me, uh, uh, yeah, I think similar to Carla, just kind of going into history and. I guess uh, Amelia, what, what you said earlier when you you, you were t uh, talking about like not small as in magnitude, but the the local heroes, you know, and mm -hmm. those leaders are, are who I'm really interested in, like like the people on in your neighborhood or in these schools, the ones that are that are affecting the change the most. Mm -hmm. You know, we have our bigger ones to be hold the spotlight, but then the smaller ones and and yeah, my dad, you know, he, he was a dean of a high school. Um, and then, you know, the kids call him dad. And whether or not he oh, has wow. specific conversations with them, he shows them, like, he shows the black kids what a man ought to be, you know, <laughs> and, and shows other kids, like, you can be this 260 pound, 6'3 <laughs> black man. And it's not a, it's not a threat. It's, it's, it, it, it's not a problem. Um, so, so those and many of them need to see a dad, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know? And a, a, a father figure. So it's, that's awesome. And, and tear down, tear down a stereotype before it can be one, like, like get in their face before they can even associate an image with something that's, that's bad. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like what, you know, that's been on my heart, what I'm thinking about how I can get involved in that way is just like the day to day leaders, you know? Yeah. Did it change, Carla and Lawrence, the minute Aurora and Christian were born? What you, you know, like Carla, you say you're 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 listening to these podcasts in history. Were you doing that prior to her birth, or has it, you know, grown because of? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it, it definitely is growing in the personal ways that I mentioned. I've always been um, interested, and in, as I've gotten older and in ways that I can stand up. And it's always been easier for me to stand up for other people, um, you know, and so I find small ways to do that. Um, and, you know, sometimes kind of small sub subversive ways as Lawrence has seen. <laughs> One of my favorite quotes is like, don't, don't mistake my kindness for weakness. <laughs> She's always gonna be five steps ahead of you. <laughs> like y'all need to know that. Always, always, <laughs> she's playing chess. <laughs> yeah, but um, but it certainly has has uh, has made it grow and deepen in the importance of it and the importance of how I hold myself. You know, because I know that she's watching me the same way that I watched my mom, and so I just want to make sure that I'm I'm being someone who I would want her to to admire. Mm. Yeah, and I, all of that, everything Carla said, and I think, you know, when you hear about these these awful, horrific moments, you know, the George Floyd, the Trayvon Martins, at a time, you know, I was similar to Marshall. I would see myself in them, and then I would get scared and upset. But now, when I hear George Floyd like cry out for his mother, like mm. I'm a father, like now the relationship to the victims. Real. has changed because now it's no longer me or my friend now it's like my son <laughs> and I don't even really know how to unpack that like I don't know what to do with that right now but that that but realizing it is an important step I mean it's 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 important but it's just also this is heartbreaking that's why I, yeah. I kind of get a little passionate about this topic because like they're someone's children like no parent wants to get a phone call and then a phone call like that. I mean, and then, and, you know, in the media, we, it becomes a moment, it becomes a movement. So then George Floyd becomes bigger than, than he just sees somebody's son, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, his birthday. Yeah. He has a favorite color, <laughs> you and, know? Yeah. But I mean, one other thing is just, you know, when you talk about father figures and needing father figures, I mean, so much of that is because of incarceration. Mm -hmm. The reason that, you know, because of the legacy of crack cocaine and, you know, all of so, so many of these things, you know, my father was incarcerated and, you know, at some point that's stuff that I'll, that I'll talk about and, you know, but it's like to think of, it's not just the people it's who are, who are put away, but their families. When you're executing people, 
wrongly, or even if they did commit a crime, but you're executing one group of people at 80% more, a higher rate than another right. group of people, that's not right. only affecting them, it's affecting their children, it's affecting their, their mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers. And how many black men are, you know, in jail because of, uh, you know, marijuana? I mean, it's, you know. That's, that's why my dad's yeah. in jail. You know, it's really, I mean, you know, to, to take a, a father away from a child for that. And, and of course, because if I was standing next to your father, I wouldn't have been. And he he did. And that's what's really the. Uh, the tragedy of that, you know, that kind of incarceration. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's incarceration for incarceration's sake. It's a way to like control. It's not even rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. which then only creates an endless cycle. So true. Um, with, two more things. <laughs> was, was there a, a book or, well, I guess you said uh, like Malcolm X, I was going to say that had a big impact on you guys. Well, for Carla and Lawrence, what, what's, um, you know, do you think about how you're going to, you know, teach your, your children about, this history like you know are, are there you know children's books now that you can pick up that you know you can read that has some of this you know hmm. there's some amazing children's books i love children's books i always <laughs> have i love children's books i love you know children's programming and their um people are doing really powerful work um right yeah i mean pbs has done incredible work around just talking about how to talk to your children about race, how to talk about, you know, um, there's a, I'm thinking of Sula, which is um, Lupita Nyong'o's um, children's yeah. book. And they're now making that into a, an animated series. That's beautiful about skin, you know, a little girl in, in dark skin. Um, but yeah, there, there, there's a, I think it's called, I want to say it's the conscious parent um, on Instagram and they have uh, they they do like book sharing um, and things like that. But yeah, they're, they're really great resources. That's yeah. awesome. It's great to and have like, that. It, like Amelia, like you're pretty much going to do whatever, do what you did. As a parent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I agree. Marshall, you're, Marshall, I mean, you turned out well. Hearing your son speak, and I think that's, uh, it, it's not like a one thing. It's not a, it, it, it's the conversation just continued. And it's just natural. And, and, and it's, 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 I'm not going to try to get Christian aware. It's just, it's just in our communication. It's, you know, me and Shay, when we're talking about what's going on, it's just part of our home life. Mm -hmm. is what I what I hope to create right because uh, this this coming from the two of them just seemed like that was home life for them and very natural yeah. right I mean if I you know we do this again hopefully we don't have to do something like this again things get better but if we do this again in like 20 years <laughs> I can have a Christian <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope we are, we are not gonna have to Marshall. do that yeah. we all <laughs> We are not going to have to do that. Is there anything that, you know, that you want to say that we didn't touch on? I, I was going to ask, but I know it's kind of heavy, you know, my, and I don't fully know the story for my parents, but I know later in my life, they started to receive reparations from the German government because of what they had I'm been through. Sure. Wow. You know, uh, right. So I was going to ask, do you have feelings on that subject? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, and no, I, really, I mean, truly, I, you know, I've been working on this piece with some friends. They're not, they, they're now friends, but um, who are, who are looking at housing policy and looking at how to use art um, to affect policy change in around housing and awareness and bridging activists with policymakers and you know and going back through the history of our country and looking at you know land that was supposed to be given that was just not and the fact that it was given to some groups but it just wasn't given to, to black people and then redlining and you know all you know um so there i mean there's so many things this legacy of wealth that we just have not had access to mm -hmm. is 
it's real. Um, and I think that there are some interesting conversations about how to handle, how to tackle reparations today that are quite possible. Mm. I think it's and, definitely a conversation that is long overdue. And I didn't, I, I'm sure I don't even understand the full scope of it. You know, I, and like I said, I don't fully understand, you know, when it happened for my parents, but, you know, I know like, you know, my mother's, my, my grandmother lost her, you know, her business was taken away. My dad's father had a fish market gone, you know, so they lost their livelihoods and their, you know, so many things and lives. My grandfather was killed, you know, so. And the seeds of things, you know, if we even saw like Watchmen or Lovecraft Country, people are now talking about, um, Oh my gosh, someone help me. City just flew Tulsa. out of me. Thank yeah. you, Tulsa, Tulsa. the Tulsa riots. Yeah. You Tulsa. know, um, but that there were communities, that there were, that people were starting and just time and time again, you know, my grandfather was a sharecropper, just like, nope, 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 yeah. actively. I think reparations is our part two because it really is, it is, it's very deep. Right? <laughs> it, it, we've been trying to wrap our brains around, and I love the work that people are doing um, to wrap our brains around what it would look like. And sometimes I think, you know, <laughs> how dare you object to affirmative action measures <laughs> when we were so much more? How dare you think this is unfair? <laughs> I mean, like, we can't even get reparations when they kill one of us. Like, how are we supposed to get reparations for anything else? Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm I'm trying to think about like when a cop or like someone was found, like any police officer was found guilty for what they've done. Um, I'm thinking about like hell, like one like on a happy, like on a very depressing, happy thing. They got Dylan Roof, but look at how they treated Dylan Roof after he, what he did. Mm -hmm. um, and we can Oh, like, you mean like they brought a McDonald's and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. Hell, I mean, they lost Kyle Rittenhouse. How do you lose Kyle Rittenhouse? <laughs> and it feels like, I'm sorry to get all upset over it, well, but, but like- it's it it, it's, it's profoundly disturbing, that's it's, why. Yeah, it's at some point, like, it's sort of like, you know, if they don't face jail time, if they only get fines, is that just like a way of saying like, oh, you have to pay X amount to get, to like do this pain. Mm. And it's sort of hard to think about reparations for me while we can't even, while it feels like we can't even get the basics. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. And that's it's like, I mean, I, I, you call it basics. I mean, that's more than that. I mean, you know, I know you're saying the word basics, but it's, it, it's, it's like justice. Ju yes, like, justice. Exactly. Justice. It's, yes, it is justice. And, and that is what is deserved. And what Marshall was saying, it's like, I also find it hard to, perceive the house it's like when y'all get when they get this bill like this bill is gonna be like they're gonna look at the amount owed and it's gonna be the biggest bill they've ever seen in their life and i don't understand how they'll be able the ones in power be able to handle it if we haven't even handled the justice system like we can't even come like the same page about on how brutal or what's excessive it's like and you're about to pay this this billion dollar bill. It's really, I mean, well, you know, I think it's all part of it. I think it's all part of it. You know, it's yeah. about really looking at these the institutions that keep us enslaved, really looking at the access to education that we don't have and how to make that more um, possible. Yeah. I mean, we need people in power who will open their ears and listen. I mean, you know, you know, you, Lawrence, you just said that about the money, but you're right. I mean, you know, we're here, we're talking about a, you know, 1.9 trillion for the COVID <coughs> that, you know, people die, 500,000 people are dead, you know, and we can't get them to pay attention. We really need to change who's in charge and who's listening and who's, 
Stacy needs to go to work. Sorry, I'm choking. Oh, right, exactly. <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> you're no, you <laughs> go to work. Wow, uh, this really was amazing. Thanks for opening your hearts to having this with me. Thank you, Alan. Thank you for having it, man. <laughs> Marshall, great to meet you. Yeah. Hope to meet you in person one day. Yeah, we can't wait to hear your music. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, everybody. That, that statement of that you were talking about the family that took your parents in, mm -hmm. 11 people to save two. It's kind of, it's the, when you look at that, it becomes like a hugely powerful statement. I'm, I'm, I know you'll be using it, but it definitely has an impact. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, I mean, I, you know, when I talked about that in a show about my mother's story, I said to people watching, like, what would you, you know, think about it? My sister says it today. You know, she doesn't know what she would do. And she has two children. They had nine, wow. you know, <clears throat> and, and, I'll say it again, it was their seven, you know, just like, you know, Lawrence is talking about Marshall, but it was their 17 year old son who had somehow come across my grandmother and my mother and asked his parents to take them in. Wow. So it was, you know, that, that young man was brought up correctly. Yes. You know, and that's where the education and the um, empathy comes from in raising the future generation. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank really. You. Thank you, Alan. Stay well. Be safe. Likewise. Great Thank spending you. time with you all. <laughs> you. Bye, guys. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in tonight. I hope you learned something. I hope you'll further educate yourself. And uh, join me March 10th for another Conversations with Alan. Uh, when I bring uh, 3GNY, third generation New York, um, they are third generation uh, children, uh, grandchildren of uh, Holocaust survivors who are trying to spread the message and make sure it never happens again. Have a great day, everybody.